So the next panel is on uh, consumers, creators, samplers and sharers and I think it will move really nicely on from the discussion that we were just having. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so I'm, we, we have run a little bit over time so I'm going to kind of cut down some um, timing. You've all got our speaker bios, we've got a fantastic panel. So. Rather than sort of spend time doing formal introductions, I just um, ask you to have a look at the bios in the materials that you have. Um, I'm just going to do a very, very quick, and I will keep it very quick, as soon as I learn how to actually use the thing. We'll go, we'll go old school. Um, and I just wanted to put some of the issues that the panel have, will be discussing in this um, session, and, and it is also relevant to the previous sessions, um, into the context of some policy debates that are happening at the moment um, and in particular with the Australian Law Reform Commission's inquiry into copyright exceptions in the digital environment. Um, a number of these issues around remixing, creating CEST in the um, issues paper for the committee. So what are in the um, issues paper for the committee? So what I wanted to do, and I will just, um, these slides will be available, but all they are is just re, um, you know, cutting and pasting from the ALRC's issues paper. So we won't spend a lot of time going into them, but really looking at how copyright materials are being used for social purposes online. Um, transformative uses, what are the market issues, what are some of the copyright issues, and what should we do about it? Um, so. And then, of course, there was a big question for a lot of people around fair use and whether we need to be dealing with some of these issues separately, um, whether we need to be dealing with them under the headings of sort of online personal use or transformative use, or whether they more appropriately dealt with under a rubric of fair use or an open-ended exception. So all of these issues are being considered at the moment. We're um, looking forward to the discussion paper coming out in... May, June, sometime around then, to see what the Commission's thinking will be along these issues. Um, but well, I, I just thought it might be useful to take two minutes just to pull out my observations from some of the submissions and some of the things that people have raised before the Commission and how that sort of feeds into the discussion we're going to have today. Um, again, for time, I won't go through all of this, but what I tried to do was pull out some of the things. These are just kind of quotes from various submissions. They're not attributed. Um, but some of the sort of owner and creator perspectives on this issue um, was concerns around the sort of what happens to business models um, if we extend exceptions. Um, what would the impact on piracy be? Um, how does it work in terms of the geocode markets that we've been discussing? Um, should you know copyright be seen as just a business input? Um, should all of these things happen? but really maybe ISPs or whatever should be paying, paying fees or maybe consumers should be paying fees in the sense of licences to have the sort of free for all, um, quote unquote, um, that seems to be happening online. Um, is it appropriate to have a one size fits all model for content or do we still need to make distinctions because of the different models that actually apply to different forms of content? Um, some other perspectives were you know, it's actually really hard to think about personal use on commercial platforms such as Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, etc. Um, how does it work with TPMs, geotargeting, all of those sorts of things? Um, of course, there was, you know, the other side of the debate was that there's a chilling effect on the market from having all this sort of uncertainty around um, uh, around the, the the appropriate boundaries. That you know, it. We're talking here about personal uses, not commercial uses, and how that really should play into the copyright debate. Um, technology neutrality is an important goal, um, and that rules that sort of define based on the technology or the, the device or whatever don't actually make any sense in a modern world. Um, should we be doing it in fair use? Should we be doing it as a sort of standalone thing where we've got some clarity about what the accepted rules are or are not? Um, and just an international, there was a strong theme around international sort of comparat um, comparisons and, and how we would place our laws in that we're talking about global markets. Does it actually make sense to have laws that are different in all of these different regions? Um, there's a heap of stuff. Um, one of the things that struck me on this question that most of the submissions all agreed was, 
that the, this sort of distinction between commercial and non-commercial in a digital world is virtually impossible and may not be helpful. Um, and in terms of the big issue on fair use, well, my very simplistic analysis, i.e. the size of the piles on my office floor, um, is that, you know, the submissions are pretty split on this issue. Um, so it's a really interesting time to be having these discussions. I'm going to stop now and turn um, to our speakers because they've got a lot more um, detailed knowledge of all of this than I do. But I think it's a really interesting observation and uh, I must say I don't envy the ALRC in its task. They're very interesting and complex questions. So our first speaker is Nick. Thank you very much. Thank you, Caroline. So I want to pick up on a couple of points that I think uh, were made in that last session. And particularly, uh, I want to pick up on, once I find my slides, a point that Ellen made, which is, how do we draw the line? And I want to start from the proposition that Creativity is ordinary and it's iterative. The creativity always draws upon past expression. That copying, borrowing, imitating is always how we learn and how we create. So from that proposition, I want to think about the current debate and the principles at stake and the tendency that we have had really to talk past each other in so much of this debate. And I think that there's a real problem there in that we don't necessarily have the consensus we need to understand what we're talking about when we're talking about fair use. So we talk about uh, the copyright balance. And in this case, in terms of uh, fair use, I'm talking particularly about the right of creators to reuse existing expression and the distinction about when that should be subject to a property right, where the original creator can refuse to license, when it should be subject to something like a statutory or compulsory license, or when it should be a non-remunerated, a free use of the existing expression. So the question I think that we don't examine in enough detail is when do artists, and by extension publishers, deserve to get paid? And here I want to pick up on a theme that Rebecca talked about, which is the purpose of copyright law. Is it utilitarian? Or is there something else that underlies it, a sense of fairness? It turns out, I think that there is. But let's start off from that proposition. It's no surprise that artists are not currently well paid. Um, this is data from a 2010 study by Trosny and Zednik, which, says, which shows that artists in almost every category are worse paid than almost every other category of worker in Australia. So we can acknowledge that. But what I'm really interested in is about derivative or transformative works in particular. And I want to think about, because artists obviously are creators and they're beneficiaries from, of, from the copyright system, but they also incur costs from the copyright system. So we need to find some sort of balance, assuming that if, you, if you're with me on the point that creativity is iterative. So the best example we have was from the Kookaburra case, obviously. The men at work, do we have music? Okay. So, I'm going to assume that you all know the Kookaburra case. Um, the enduring question that I don't think we have an answer to is do Mary and Sinclair's heirs, their, her successors in title, have an entitlement, a moral entitlement, to 5% of the ongoing and for the last six years royalties of Men at Work song Down Under for those two bars of the flute riff that were taken, well, sorry, the flute riff that, composed two, that comprised two bars of the original song written as part of a Girls Guides composition. And I think that's a legitimately tough question that we don't have consensus on. At what point do we draw the line to say that some uses should be remunerated and some uses should not? 
So I don't want to spend too much time because I think the discussion is going to be much more interesting. But that's my basic point. A caveat is that I'm using a lot of examples that are not new media because this is not a new phenomenon. This is not digital only. Uh, the implication, though, is that I'm also using a lot of examples that draw upon public domain material. Now, I acknowledge that I haven't gone through uh, the quite arduous process of working out when each original um, author died and whether or not copyright has expired in any particular example. But I think that, in general, it gives us a feel for how people create and what the issues will be in the future as well as in the past. So Van Gogh, in particular, um, had a fascinating set of letters that you can read to his brother explaining his relationship with prior works. This is an example from Jean-Francois Millet um, called Nobody Rest in 1866. And in explaining his copying, Van Gogh said to his brother that it's a study I need for I want to learn. And you could see his ambivalence in the letters that he wrote to his brother because he didn't want to be identified as a mere copyist. But he also really needed that access, really needed that process in order to develop his own style. So there's interesting questions. It's quite clearly a reproduction. Uh, and without some sort of, ex of exception, it's infringing. So the question is, should it be infringing? Should royalties be paid if they were dealing with contemporaneous works? And the questions extend. How much copying is too much? This is Marcel Duchamp's copy of the Mona Lisa. What he has done is add a moustache to it and down the bottom, a French pun. How much copying is too much? At what point do we say, or how do we draw the line in Ellen's words? And this is the conversation I think that we haven't necessarily had. We've been deferring, I guess, to the US approach of fair use. But I think there's more to it than that. And I think we could have a more fruitful discussion. Here's a recent example. This is Shepard Ferry's poster, uh, the famous Hope poster made famous in the US elections recently. She Shepard Ferry quite obviously copied from Manny Garcia, didn't do himself any favors by denying it, um, any subsequent behavior about the evidence in the case. But there's a really interesting question. What is it about this? Do we and it became wildly famous, obviously. Do we believe that in those circumstances that Garcia is entitled to an to a share of the proceeds? Or do we not? Do we say, is there something else about it? Is it political expression? Is it that this later pro, uh, poster doesn't really affect the original market for Garcia's work? I'm not sure. We haven't had this conversation. One common answer is that licensing will fix all of this. And I don't have any sound. Uh, but I was going to play you uh, somebody that I used to know from Gautier and uh, show how similar that was, obviously, to um, Louis Bontas Seville in 1967. Now, Gautier has gone through and licensed this through the existing licensing system. And sometimes licensing works quite smoothly, and something, sometimes that's desirable. But again, it's an enduring question. When do we draw the line? How much can we take for free? How much do we need to trace the profits back? And more importantly, perhaps, how far do we trace the profits back? I did a quick search on whosampled.com to see, to find some discussion about um, how many, well, this is an interesting discussion about who could find the longest chain of sampling in the whosampled.com database. And uh, Jay Gums here has said that he's found a chain that runs seven songs deep and 36 years in time. That from a link from a 1966 song all the way through to a 2002 song with five or six songs in between. So how deep do we follow this process? If we assume that um, royalties need to be paid back at one time, do they go back all the way through the chain? Where do we actually draw the line? Other questions? How much is too much? This is the book March, winner of the Pulitzer Prize, tells the story of the absent father in Little Women. Takes that character and extrapolates a backstory for where he was when, in, when Little Women was taking place. Or an example that was already mentioned this morning, Fifty Shades of Grey, started off as fan fiction 
for the Twilight series. These are individual acts of creativity and may well be excused as fair use in that they're telling a new transformative story. They don't necessarily interfere with the original market. On the other hand, the novel 60 years later, a US court found did infringe. This story told um, essentially a sequel of the character from Catcher in the Rye transposed to Manhattan 60 years later. And in the court's view, this story was too close to the original, was too close to the protectable core of the original and couldn't be told without a license. So one answer is to adopt that um, the entirety of US case law and to build our own, um, to build our own set of principles after that. But I want to challenge you right now to think about this in slightly broader terms. And I want to ask, what is copyright for? Because I think this is something that we don't have agreement on, and I think that it's something that's holding up our debate and our discussions in the current reform process. The common statement, and particularly strong in the US, the copyright is a utilitarian right. It exists to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. So copyright is a necessary evil in order to incentivize new creation. The problem, from our perspective, transformative use with that construction is that there's not much evidence then that the derivative works right is a good bargain. Uh, there's an author here, this is Derek Van Bau in his article, Faulty Math in 2008, says that on the available empirical evidence, the derivative right, the right to prevent people from telling other stories based upon an original author's work, doesn't necessarily, or doesn't appear to make economic sense. So my question is, let's go back to this principle. What does deserve mean in this statement? When do authors deserve to get paid when future authors use their works? And I think that's the question that we really need to think about in this reform process. And I think that it's more than a property right. I think that there are important and sometimes competing values here. The ability of people to learn, to act on what they have learnt, to express themselves. We have a social imperative of new innovation and creativity. And of course, that aspect of reward, of just desserts. And I think that when we can uh, have this conversation, I think that might help us move forwards in this um, fairly dichotomous argument about whether or not we should introduce a fair use or a transformative use exception. Okay, thank you.